Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Mike Vandersteen. And as you know, every month we try to bring a different department to you, talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities. And this, this month we're very pleased to have Mike Collard with, her, with us, our HR Director. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Adam. Now, how long have you been our Human Resources Director? I know time flies. Time does fly. It's been uh, seven and a half years now. It'll be eight years in December. So very glad to, to be here and glad to have uh, had the time that I've had so far and hope it uh, continues for a few more years. Same here, same here. Well, please mm -hmm. share with our viewers a little bit about the role, responsibilities of the Human Resources Department. Well, the Human Resources Department is primarily concerned with all aspects of our county employees. Uh, everything ranging from compensation and, and benefits and uh, you know helping them out with orientation to their jobs and job descriptions uh, to uh, also working with the unions of course since the majority of our employees are represented by unions and uh, we do handle the negotiations with <coughs> unions adjust grievances that arise and generally take care of quite a few issues uh, that really affect all of our county departments and you know, folks might be surprised to hear you're not a real large department. What, how many employees do you have in HR and where are their areas of expertise? We have a total of four employees, uh, including myself, uh, so, so three other staff. Uh, awesome staff that we have, uh, including Penny, who does uh, uh, a lot of assistance uh, to the labor relations, working with the unions, uh, workers' compensation matters, uh, compensation employee uh, pay issues, uh, and so forth. Um, really my right-hand person in the office, and then uh, Ruth uh, does an outstanding job with our employee benefit programs. We do a lot of those things in-house in our department, uh, which many organizations contract out or have done outside the office, and, and Ruth takes care of a lot of those things, including our wellness program uh, as well. And then Courtney, who's the, uh, the office secretary and front desk person and handles a lot of the recruiting matters, the employee files, uh, orientations of new employees and assistance with a wide variety of questions. So very proud of the staff and happy to be working with them. Good staff and as you said, four of you, but countywide, how many total employees do we have and how many bargaining units are you working with? Well, the total number of county employees currently stands at 947. So we're just a little under a thousand. Uh, those employees come in different varieties. Uh, many different types of jobs are included and uh, that includes for instance, county board members uh, and other board members of you know, the board of, uh, uh, you know, some of the boards that deal with different uh, county departments and specific issues that are appointed by the county board chair or the county board. Uh, and then there are certain seasonal employees or temporary employees that we have, student help out at Rocky Knoll and so forth. So it comes down to something on the order of 860 regular employees who are in permanent or you know long-term regular either part-time or full-time positions. And then bargaining units. Yeah. I know we have non-bargaining, bargaining. How's that break out? How many bargaining units are there? There are eight different bargaining units that we, that we deal with. Each bargaining unit has its own union representatives and, and team who, um, who uh, represent the interests of those employees when dealing with their employer, uh, especially with respect to pay issues and schedule issues and other terms and conditions of employment. Uh, so there are a total of eight groups, and they vary quite a bit in size. The largest group is the supportive services group, kind of the miscellaneous general employees, uh, about 260 or 270 employees in that union, all the way down to uh, currently, I believe, our smallest unit is the uh, registered nurses unit at Rocky Knoll, which has uh, only around 20 members. And I think they, they comprise about 89% of our total workforce. That's right. So a large majority, uh, just a little over 10% are non-union, who are mainly the managers and a few other specialized uh, professionals in particular. And what's happened with the workforce? Is it, is it increasing? Is it holding about the same? Is it, is it decreasing? What's been happening of late? Well, it's, it's not been increasing. Uh, I, I would say that over the past 10 years even, there's been, I would say, a very gradual decline in the number of employees overall, with one big drop that happened when the, the county uh, sold the Sunny Ridge nursing home and we had about 260 employees there. It was up to 300 at, at one time. So of course that was a significant drop in the number of employees. Otherwise it's been, you know, tightening of the belt here and there has, has, has reduced a few people. We did uh, unfortunately because of the budget concerns have to uh, do a few layoffs uh, for 2010. 
uh, at the beginning of the year and a few more uh, more recently at the highway department. Uh, but it's still been relatively stable, but just gradually declining because of uh, budget pressures. I know a lot of our viewers may not be aware of this, but our, as you well know, Mike, our pay total payroll costs are less today than they were in 2002. So that certainly has contributed to us being able to hold the line or reduce property taxes. And as you said, we, we certainly haven't been uh, getting any larger. And, and frankly, based on budget constraints, I think we're going to continue to be tightening our belts. Um, how large is the overall budget when you factor in employee wage and benefits? What proportion is that? Well, the, for 2010, our current year, the total budget for wages alone is over $41 million. Um, so obviously, that's the largest portion of the county budget overall, which, as you know, is in the neighborhood of, I think, $140 million, and almost as much alone as the tax levy. The amount that, that we charge in <coughs> property taxes is about $45 million. Now, on top of the $41 million for wages, that's not the whole story. We also have uh, various employee benefits. That's another $17 or $18 million on top of that. So we're up to about $58 million uh, in uh, wages and benefits overall for the current year. And what do you mean when you say benefits? What types of benefits do employees receive? Well, the two biggest areas are, uh, first of all, the pension, I would mention. Uh, we're part of the state retirement system, and the county pays for every employee a certain percentage of their wages into the retirement system to fund that benefit, which is then administered by the state fund. <clears throat> it's an ex excellent benefit, an excellent fund. It's well managed by the state. Uh, but the reason it's well managed is they insist that we put that money in uh, as we go in sufficient quantities to pay for that benefit. So it's quite expensive. It's currently 11% of wages for most employees, a little bit more for certain categories, in particular law enforcement uh, sworn officers. Uh, the next uh, biggest benefit, or actually the largest benefit, in fact, is the health insurance, of course, which is, um, well, for next year, we're looking at about $11 million in county budget just for health insurance. Then there are a few other things. There's some dental insurance, which is not a particularly expensive benefit, um, a little bit of um, life insurance and, and so forth, and uh, long-term disability insurance for certain employees. Uh, and of course, then the paid time off benefits, such as vacation and, and sick leave, which don't come directly out of the county budget, but obviously are, are very useful or a good benefit for our employees as well. Now, the cost of health insurance is certainly you know very very well it has been a real challenge for us as we've seen double digit increases over the last five eight years and I know that you've been creative working with some other staff to redesign our health insurance plan mm -hmm. and in brief what what's happened with health insurance cost number one what, mm -hmm. what kind of increases had have we had to absorb and then secondly what have we done to mitigate that well, I think uh, one of my most important jobs is to try to keep some control of that health insurance number because it's obviously a huge part of the county budget and, and something we need to try to keep under control. So I've been very pleased that over the last four years, the increases have been relatively low, under 5% each year for the past four years. Um, we've worked very hard to keep that number down. Unfortunately, projecting ahead to 2011, it looks like it's going to have to be a little bit bigger than that. Uh, in the neighborhood of 10% or so, uh, we anticipate. But um, the things we can do to address it are uh, uh, things we have done include changes to the, to the benefit design. A big change was made in 2008 as a result of some strenuous negotiations, of course. We think we have a much better plan design a as a whole. Um, I would say we've been very aggressive in searching for the best bargains. And I want to explain one thing, that we're a self-funded plan, as you know. Uh, so it's not a matter of shopping for a better premium or finding an insurance company that will give us a better deal and not gouge us, uh, as you know, some people think insurance companies do. No, our costs are actually directly paid by us. We're essentially operating our own little insurance company uh, just for our employees and whatever the costs are, they are. So the only way we can control those costs is by kind of negotiating with the doctors, with the health care providers. We don't have enough leverage to do that on our own, so we do it primarily by joining various networks and paying to participate in some of these benefit arrangements. We've been very aggressive in finding the deals that give us the best benefit, the best discounts uh, from the major health care provider uh, systems. Uh, and so that's really paid off in, in some savings. We also uh, operate our own clinic. 
and tie that together with our wellness program because really the best way to save money on health insurance is to keep employees a little bit healthier and even just a few um, instances of, of people avoiding those expensive medical problems which are bad for people and bad for the budget uh, really pay off in the long run. So about 4% increases the last four years or so, or under 5%. Never chance. Uh, we're looking at it as about 10% for 2011. Mm -hmm. But again, correct me if I'm wrong, but prior to four years ago, we had some 15, 18% increases. We really got hit hard. Up to 30%. We had one year it was at 30%. So in fact, we had six consecutive years where the increase was higher than 10% each year. And so we came up with you know 111 percent over five years and, and numbers like that that really um, you know, doubled in a fairly short amount of time the, the cost of health insurance. So we haven't seen that lately, but it's it's an area where you have to run twice as fast to stay in the same place uh, and work twice as hard to to keep those controls every year because we're fighting against a trend. When we go to our consultant and ask for projections, we're working against a trend of 11 percent increases a year that's out there kind of in the state generally for plans of our type. Tough to, tough to hold the line when you have to absorb those kind of increases. And I know it's not just a public sector challenge, it's a private sector challenge as well. Oh, Thank you, Mike. So. Mike, you mentioned the in-health clinic and uh, could you give us a little bit of an idea of what kind of services that are provided by the in-health clinic? Um, why the costs are more effective for us? And then the participation level mm -hmm. of our employees with the in-health clinic over time? Sure, I'm very proud of the clinic because it's really a little bit of an innovation for us that, that most organizations of our type do not have. And we do, do the clinic a little differently than most employers, even, even the large employers that have such a clinic would, would handle it. Uh, the clinic is staffed primarily by a nurse practitioner, an advanced practice nurse practitioner, who is not a doctor, but it's a level of, of training and expertise that's really the next rung below an MD in that it's more advanced than a physician's assistant, for instance, or a registered nurse. Uh, there's an LPN, a licensed practical nurse, who assists her in the clinic. But uh, the nurse practitioner can handle most of, of, of the basic health care needs for many people. You know, she can give physical exams, she can give injections, she can prescribe medication. So she can deal with the, the sore throats, you know, the, the, the bumps and bruises, the scrapes, the, the regular ongoing treatment, uh, in my mind, more efficiently than, than even a doctor's office can because it's very leanly staffed and very efficiently set up. Uh, it's run for us, not directly by the county. We don't hire the nurse practitioner ourselves. Uh, we contract with another company to run it for us. The company we contract with is called Intera Health. Uh, and they're based in Milwaukee and they, they specialize in doing clinics for employers and, and things like that. Uh, so we were happy to set them up uh, as our operator of this clinic uh, and they've been great to work with and very flexible in, in setting it up the way we want and the way we see it, it'll have the, the most impact to us. Uh, we also think it's an advantage to have that independent operator for it because then she's free, the clinic staff, the nurse practitioner, is free to work with Aurora, to work with St. Nicholas Hospital people or Marshall <coughs> Medical Cl uh, Clinic people or any of the other healthcare providers in the area completely impartial. And so we think that that really is going to have a, a beneficial uh, effect on our employees and we think that will eventually show up in the claims. Um, the cost of running the clinic is actually a little bit less than the cost we would pay to uh, outside medical providers on average, even when we take into account you know, the rent that we pay and the overhead as well as the fact that we don't charge employees any deductibles to go use the clinic. So it's a big benefit to employees. Um, if I need something done, if I need a physical exam, or if I need you know, my allergy medication adjusted, I can go see the nurse practitioner and I pay nothing. No co-pays, no deductibles. I don't see a bill at all, which is a great benefit for employees. Uh, so I think more employees, frankly, ought to be taking advantage of that. And I, I would certainly like to see that increase. It's been at about 20, 22 percent of employees uh, and their dependents who, who really take advantage of that program. The ones who do take advantage are very happy with it. They really like to see it expand. 
And w what kind of money do you estimate that the taxpayer has seen in savings mm -hmm. with the operation of this in-health clinic versus the, the mm -hmm. uh, old way of handling it? Would just go to see your own practitioner? There's a little bit of savings net uh, every month, maybe a couple <clears throat> thousand dollars a month. Uh, that's in addition to the savings the employees uh, have by not having to pay the deductibles or co-pays. Uh, I think the real benefit, though, is something that's very hard, if not impossible, to measure, which is that I think we're starting to see it already, it affecting our overall claims dollars. People are getting a little bit better, more thorough advice up front about how to handle their own personal health, because the nurses there don't just deal with you know, patching you up and sending you out. They really take a look at the whole person, spend more time with the person, do a lot of health coaching lifestyle coaching, help employees who are interested in quitting smoking or losing weight. So we really have that tied into an overall wellness program, uh, which we then can, can run without, without cost because it's included as part of our clinic package. And uh, we, we definitely would like to see that pay off in the long run by just having healthier employees. I, th I think we are starting to see that. Well, that's good to, to hear. And, and last year, we also won an award for that program from the, the Foth Good Government Award. And sure. I congratulate you on that. That was a, a great effort, and it really paid off and is paying off for Sheboygan County. Thank right you. now at the federal level, we're seeing a lot of changes in the health plans and, and the way the, the government's uh, drafting new legislation. Mm -hmm. How are those changes affecting us here in Sheboygan County? Well, that's something if I really uh, studied up on it, we could probably talk about for the half hour alone because the health care reform effort, especially at the federal level, but we also have some state law changes, are so complex um, and affect us in so many ways that uh, uh, we don't even know the full impact by any means. We're only starting really to understand uh, some of the things, especially those that will take uh, effect right away. Uh, there's certainly some things that we know are going to affect us uh, fairly immediately and are, in fact, already affecting us. Uh, one of those provisions, for instance, requires us to allow employees' dependents to stay on the plan, children to stay on the plan until they're age 26. You know, even, even if they're not college students or, or not in school anywhere. Uh, so that's adding a whole group of people to our plan without any additional premiums revenue being paid in. So that, of course, is going to cost us, and we, and we estimate between 1% and 1.5% of total premiums as a result of that change. So that's an extra cost. One other source of cost is the provision that um, requires plans such as ours to remove their lifetime maximum limits on the, number, on the amount of benefits that can be paid. Now, we have or had a $2 million lifetime limit on the medical benefits we'd pay for any one person, which is very high. We haven't reached it, thank goodness. Uh, but just because that cap is removed, we have to have some backup insurance for the very large claims. So that's going to cost us, we estimate, about $50,000 extra next year. Those are just a couple of examples of things. Um, one good thing that may result is there is some provision in the plan for reimbursement for some retiree health insurance costs. It's still very unclear how much of that is actually going to come back and help us. We're certainly looking to get some reimbursement in that area. And then the real big impact comes in the year 2014, so we're looking ahead to that, uh, when the requirement uh, kicks in that, that essentially all individuals have to have the health coverage and these exchanges are set up and so forth. There's a lot of work to do before I can really <laughs> estimate the impact of that. Right now, I think uh, it may end up being a cost to us just because of provisions that say we have to essentially provide a voucher to an employee who might want to go and buy insurance from one of the exchanges. It might actually increase the number of employees we're paying for for their health coverage. But um, it's really too early to be able to estimate what, what that impact will be. One other thing that's going to be impacting our, our budget is uh, the work that you're doing with our labor unions in uh, negotiating new contracts. Could you give us a, a little bit of a feeling for where you are in that and what's going to be happening this year? A lot of our seven, out of our eight bargaining units, I should say, uh, we have contracts, typically a two-year contract uh, with each bargaining unit. Seven out of those eight contracts expire in December. The one that doesn't expire is with the, the health care centers group uh, we entered into a longer contract with them that runs through 2012. But obviously we're in the position now of needing to start negotiations, and we have started negotiations with several units 
to try to work out a new agreement that will take effect uh, in 2011 and cover 2011 through 2012. In fact, we may be negotiating with eight because there's some indication that the one we have settled might want to have some further discussions with us, which would be, which would be great. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, meeting with uh, eight different groups of employees, and uh, everything's on the table, including obviously wages and health insurance and you know other issues that, that come up, but um, no settlements yet. Uh, we, ha we have a long way to go to, to achieve those agreements. Now, you mentioned that these contracts expire at the end of the year. Do you think we'll, we'll have those negotiations concluded by that time? And if we don't, how does that handle? I can't honestly say that I think that we will. Um, mm. We certainly are trying to be in a position to reach an agreement uh, with any union that is, that is willing to reach an agreement with us early on because it's obviously better for everyone if we know what the, what the uh, terms of employment are going to be before, before the work happens. Uh, uh, historically speaking, on the other hand, it's been a pretty rare event to have contracts settled before the end of the year. It's unfortunately all too common uh, in our system, and not just to Sheboygan County, but to other counties, cities, villages throughout the state, that um, negotiations often go well into the, the next year after that and sometimes even beyond. Uh, and what, uh, what do we do if we can't come to an agreement with the union? How is, is that handled? Yeah. Well, the first thing is we have to continue following the old contract. Uh, we don't go into a period where we can do what we want because we have no agreement. We have to keep following the old contract. Uh, if we're unable to reach an agreement, even you know after how many months of negotiations, then eventually the uh, State Employment Relations Commission will appoint an arbitrator, first a mediator to come in and help us reach an agreement, and then eventually an arbitrator to simply decide which side is being more reasonable and which side has... Uh, the better offer in the arbitrator's decision, and then it's it's kind of winner take all, and the arbitrator says either the union wins or the county wins, and we uh, we have to abide by that decision. I think we had two cases that went to arbitration last year, and we won one and lost one, didn't we? That's correct. We had yeah. two bargaining units that we out of eight that we didn't reach agreement with, so we reached six agreements, and uh, the other two went to an arbitrator and. Uh, we essentially made the same offer in each case that we had uh, made to the ones that settled, but uh, the arbitrator in one case, the deputies union, ruled in the deputies' favor and, and granted a uh, higher wage increase than, than we were um, thinking was, was uh, justified at the time. And then uh, in the social workers' unit, uh, went the other way, and the arbitrator said that the wage offer we had was acceptable. Well, thanks for that update. With that, we'll turn it back over to Adam. Yeah. Mike. Obviously, you do a lot of work with all of our employees, and, and that's your key focus. But as you know, there are a number of people in the private sector that are looking for work. Folks are struggling, and this is an area of expertise for you. Any advice to our viewers who are, might be watching right now that are currently unemployed, looking to get into the workforce, uh, what are some, some steps that they should consider taking if they mm -hmm. haven't already? Sure. I mean, unemployment, I think, is a terrible problem because I mean, it's just so destructive to, to individuals and families and destructive to the economy and the community as a whole. So I really hope that turns around and we, we get back to seeing more uh, uh, full employment levels. Uh, but if, uh, if one of our viewers out there is in that position, I mean, the advice I'd give is really in two parts. One is, one is long-term advice. Uh, if you want to have a good job, you really have to do your homework and lay some groundwork and, and prepare to have that good career. So the first step is really pick a field where uh, people with skills will be in demand and then develop those skills. And there are a lot of different areas, a lot of different fields, and I'm not going to give advice about what's the best field to go into because that depends on the person. But you can't do it at the last minute. You really have to, to prepare that uh, often years ahead, sometimes weeks or months ahead, depending on what the type of job is. But it's essential if you want to have a good job to get a skill that other people don't have and you want to really think through that and, and what skill you could develop and what would really put you in a position so that employers would need you because they're not going to pay you unless they need what you have. Uh, once you get to the point of actually applying for a job, looking for a job, meeting with an employer, it comes down to the fundamentals that really haven't changed much over, over many years. But we see more and more people, frankly, forgetting or, or not realizing what these job-seeking skills entail. Uh, again, it's a matter of doing your homework and coming prepared. 
you know, act like you really want the job. Do some homework. Investigate the job you're looking into before you go meet with the employer. Come to the interview, you know, looking your absolute best and sounding your best and sounding like you want to be a part of their team. Uh, follow up with any personal contacts you have. Uh, you know, don't show up late. You know, you see people doing all sorts of things. They come to an interview late and not prepared and asking about the job and things they should know. It's all too easy for the employer to find a reason not to hire you. You want to make that employer want to hire you. Uh, so really put your best pay face on things and, and doing the homework is essential. And when we say doing the homework, Mike and I mm -hmm. both have the opportunity to be involved with a number of interviews. and. I'm always amazed when folks don't take the time to even look at our county website if it's a county position or, sure. you know, as you said, doing some background, doing some homework. It always impresses us when they can refer to things they've looked at or homework they've done on the website because we know they've taken the extra effort. So that's excellent advice. And speaking of county employment, though, mm -hmm. we only have a few minutes left. Uh, we're certainly not in a, a growing mm -hmm. stage here. but. But positions do open, and they are not always filled internally. Uh, Rocky Knoll, with, with providing health care, nurses, nurses' aides, LPNs, mm -hmm. they see some turnover there. What does someone do if they're interested in pursuing a county position? And you're right, Rocky Knoll is one area where we're always hiring or interested in hiring the right people with the right skills. And a CNA, Certified Nurses Aid Job, you know, that kind of training, it's a definite skill, but can be acquired in a relatively short amount of time. So if that's something people are interested in, we'd certainly encourage people to apply out there. Uh, the other area where we, we still do hiring fairly regularly is in the law enforcement department where the correctional staff uh, always has some turnover. There are always some openings there. Sometimes it's hard to keep them filled. It's a very difficult job, but again, one that many people can qualify for with relatively little experience, but certainly some training. Uh, if people, and there are a wide variety of other jobs, as you know, we have, you know, 150 different job classifications, I think, in the county, and then they open up from time to time. If anyone out there is interested in county employment in any of these areas, uh, the two places uh, that are best to look are, first of all, on the county website. You click on the employment button or click on departments and human resources, then there's a, an employment button there. We always list open, current openings at our own website. We also also list current openings at the Wisconsin Job Net, which is the uh, the website associated with the State Department of uh, Vacations, and uh, they have an office obviously in Sheboygan uh, where you can go and actually look on their computers. But uh, you can access that over the internet very easily. Mike, excellent, mm -hmm. excellent presentation overview. Thank you for joining us. And mm -hmm. if you want to learn more about our HR. Uh, issues or have questions or suggestions for Mr. Collard, please don't hesitate to contact us. All that information is on the website, so you can contact Mike directly or a member of his staff. And, and again, a very nice overview. Thank you for joining us today, Mike. Well, thank you, Adam. Glad to be here. Until next time, on behalf of the Sheboygan County Board and myself, thanks for joining us. Next month, our new finance director, Mr. Terry Hansen, will be with us. And that name may sound familiar because he used to be the finance director for the city of Sheboygan, has now been with Sheboygan County coming up on three months. So we look forward to having him here. And until then, thanks for joining us.